So uh, gray foxes are pretty interesting. They're not a species that we have in the high desert here in Oregon, but they are down in California, Nevada, and Utah in the region that we do interpret here at the museum. In Oregon, you'll find them primarily west of the Cascades. Um, here in the Bend area, we have, of course, we have coyotes, uh, red fox, and possibly wolves, but not gray foxes as much. But the, coy or the gray fox is unique among those, those um, canid species because they're arboreal. And like she's showing you right now, they have uh, semi-retractable claws and they can actually climb trees. So that makes them unique, um, different than red fox, coyotes, or wolves. She came from uh, Bend in Oregon, down along the coast in southwestern Oregon. And her story, basically what I understand, is she wandered into somebody's house. She was wearing a collar. She was extremely emaciated. Um, and those folks whose house she wandered into, they took her to a wildlife rehabber, and they found that in addition to being emaciated, she had a badly dislocated hip. So we can only speculate about what happened to her prior to wandering into those folks' house. But she was probably being illegally kept as a pet, escaped from her owners, wasn't doing so well in the wild, became injured, and then sought out humans for, for help. So the rehabber determined she's habituated to humans, um, which we're seeing right now in the enclosure as she goes after the cameraman. <laughs> but um, so the habituation in and of itself would have made her unable to survive in the wild. She would have gotten into trouble with other human beings. But the, the injury as well, um, the dislocated hip ended up being non-repairable. So they had to do what they call a femoral head ostectomy where they remove a portion of the femur. And she gets around pretty well, but even a minor disability like that would probably compromise her ability to survive in the wild. So they, like I said, they do exist in the high desert eco region that we interpret. And just like all species, they have an important role to play. But one of the unique things that they can teach our visitors here at the museum is just about native foxes more generally. And here in our region, we have the Sierra Nevada red fox and the Rocky Mountain red fox, which are montane species of red fox. Um, and she looks very similar to them um, and has a relatively similar ecology. But those are the species that we're concerned about here in our region conservation wise. And there's been a lot of study and work on that species um, in the last five to 10 years. We don't have a Sierra Nevada red fox at the museum. We're unlikely to get one, but we can get the gray fox and use her um, as an ambassador to tell that story of the work that's being done in our area. So she came from a situation where she was being handled a lot by human beings. And so our main concern with bringing her here was that we kept keep her really well socialized. So when we got her, we didn't put her directly in the exhibit. She lived kind of down in the BOP area with wildlife staff interacting every day to kind of start that training process. We're still trying to get her trained to do um, things other than just be on exhibit. But she lived down there for the first month or two. When we got her, she also wasn't cold hardy, so we didn't want her spending nights outdoors. Uh, so that process has been gradual. Uh, and when you look at her rear left or rear right side, you can see that she's been shaved and that's because of the surgery that she had. So her hair is starting to grow back in. Um, and now that that's happened, we have her in her exhibit where she's sleeping outdoors um, all night long. So the atrium that the fox is in used to belong to our bobcat, Vivi, but we modified it for the fox by removing some of the trees um, and then creating a variety of climbing structures for her because the gray fox is arboreal. So she's got a number of trees that she can climb on, logs she can get on, she has two above ground shelters and she has a below ground den. The most common question we get is why is she here? Even though we have a sign that talks about her story and the reason why she's in captivity, people often don't notice the sign um, and they're concerned that the, the surgery location where it looks like she's been shaved, that she's been scratching, but that's not the case. She's actually been shaved. Um, and then the other question we get all the time, and I get this with the red foxes that we have locally too, uh, they, they ask, is she, is she unusually small? And the answer is no, she weighs about nine pounds and, and gray foxes will weigh anywhere from six to 11 or 12 pounds. So she's kind of right in the middle of the size range for her species. But a lot of times with native wildlife, when people see them in a captive situation, um, they seem smaller than animals they've seen in the wild. Um, and that's perfectly normal, people, humans, overall tend to overestimate the size of animals when they, when they see them out on the trails and stuff. So life expectancies for most species in the wild are lower than, than, than you would think because of all the challenges that they face in a natural environment. They're suffering mechanical injuries, they're having a hard time finding food, they get diseases. We shelter them from all of that in captivity, so captive lifespans for all of the species we keep at the museum tend to be a lot longer. 
Um, so for a gray fox in the wild, um, I would be surprised to see many individuals over five or six years old, and they'll live 10, 11 years in captivity. She's feisty, so she, she's very playful, uh, very extremely energetic. Uh, she's a little bit mischievous. Um, she tends to be really high energy in the mornings. Now that she's settled into the exhibit, she likes to take naps midday, but in the morning and in the evening, she's very, very, very rambunctious. She is primarily a carnivore. They are technically, they're omnivores. So we do offer her some fruits and vegetables, seeds and nuts. She, she likes nuts quite a bit. Um, but as with most of our, our omnivore species here at the museum, meat is the preference. So when we give them a, a bowl full of meat and there's some veg in it, they often won't eat the vegetables. Um, and that's what we're seeing with her. She tends to prefer the meat. Whole mice in particular seem to be a favorite right now, but she does like hazelnuts. That's, that's one that she really likes. We also give her a lot of insects. So she's getting mealworms and crickets. And the crickets that we give her, um, we have what we call a cricket dispenser, which is just a coffee can with a small hole drilled in the bottom. And we can put a bunch of crickets in the coffee can and they'll escape one at a time through the, the hole. And visitors like to watch her chase the crickets. So we do that a couple times a week. She gets a lot of scent enrichment, so uh, most of our cars respond really well to peppermint oil, and she likes peppermint oils, but also fox urine, um, other animal kind of urine smells she likes a lot. We'll spray those up on the logs, and she'll rub in it for visitors. She's got a number of toys that she likes, rubber con toys, <clears throat> food puzzles, things we can hide food in. Um, so those are a big hit with her. And then she gets lots of training and playtime with um, different handlers. Yeah, there's food up there. <laughs>